So welcome today. I am speaking with Anna Katarina Schaffner, who is both an academic researcher, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, and a, um, a coach. Would you define you yourself as a life coach or? Mm, probably not life coach. Yeah, just just exhaustion coach. And um, yeah, I'm also I just quit my university job. So I'm now a full-time writer and a coach. And that's good. So you're doing a little bit the opposite of what I did. It's like I refused to enter academia when I was younger to be a full-time writer. And then I, I decided that this would not necessarily be incompatible. But congratulations for, for uh, daring to jump out of the, uh, the sort of a golden... Um, prison of academia and so what is an exhaustion uh coach is that did you uh, exhaust your clients until they <laughs> they have an epiphany the opposite Louis. <laughs> right. um yeah so i i work with um the weary the exhausted you know with people who languish i have a lot of clients who are burned out um and the kind of work i do with them is first of all to understand you know what caused their exhaustion what what draws out their energy um in what areas of life you know they they feel dead and stuck and then um we use various different tools and techniques to um to make sure that they can reconnect to their purpose and to what is fulfilling to them and what gives them energy and we use um stoic techniques so i'm a huge fan of the stoic circle of control which is fantastic for people who are um you know short on energy because knowing where to spend our attention and where to direct our energy our limited energy too is is really important especially when we don't have a lot of it um so a lot of my clients really are you know either languishing or are properly burned out and burnout is a, an extremely serious condition you know that makes people completely unable to to function at work and often also in their private lives and um and I, I, I started out working on exhaustion as an academic. I wrote a long history of exhaustion. I was really interested in, you know, the 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 idea that we've never been as exhausted before, you know, that burnout is the, um, you know, the epidemic of our age that, you know, neoliberal capitalism has is, is sucking us all dry because we have so much energy to expend, too many stimuli, social media is constantly you know, capitalizing our attentions. I was really curious about whether people in the past have also felt exhausted or whether we are alone with that struggle. That sounds really um, intriguing because I was thinking about, you know, sometimes when people are beginners in, in philosophical thinking, I tend to tell them, go to the etymology whenever you're stuck go to the etymology of the word yeah i was immediately thinking what might be the etymology of exhaustion yeah exhaurire <laughs> the depletion of a limited resource right a limited there yeah, so that's i mean wouldn't you say that it's a matter of point of view also. I mean, of course, it, it's a matter of getting trapped into certain behavior, right? And then you do uh, end up uh, tapping into resources that are limited. But also, I was thinking about a point of view in the sense that there is a perspective from which we are, uh, life is unlimited, right? Life is uh a, a sort of a ever renewing process uh and of course it seems to be some sort of a dialectic there because perhaps the person who gets into a burnout is someone who ha in some cases might have had too much faith into their capacity to to continue forever right mm. 
yeah. but perhaps that faith can be sort of rediscovered uh, for uh, what it is, which is a trust in life. But life is not just about this line of production, right? That you were suggesting yeah. when you talked about capitalism. Yeah, I think actually you, you're mentioning interesting metaphors there as well. I think quite a lot of the talk about productivity, you know, all the productivity hacks, the idea that we can reprogram ourselves, that we like machines that need to change their hard wiring, that we like computers that need, you know, like a kind of refresh or we need new software or we need to um, fine tune some of our mechanics. You know, these metaphors are really damaging because we are, you know, organisms that are alive and changing and are interacting with our environments and um, we are not in any way like machines but a lot of the self-help literature out there and a lot of the you know kind of coaching talk as well uses very mechanical very um, technological metaphors that liken us to robots who can just keep on going. And of course we can't. We need a good balance between spending energy and renewing our energy. And I think what um, I see in a lot of my clients is that when you enter the burnout cycle, you, you become cut off from what re-energizes you. So you just expend and you expend energy on tasks mm. that become increasingly right. more toilsome and laborsome and difficult but you don't allow yourself to replenish you know because mm. you, you fall behind in your work you get ever more stressed about your workload and the fact that you're not coping so you cut out rest you cut out joy you cut out connections with others and that's a vicious cycle and then you just end up with a total imbalance between what energizes you and what costs you energy and that's one of the first you know terrible mechanics of of burnout that you just spend energy and you don't replenish it and then also resting becomes um, almost impossible for people who are burned out you know they kind of languish in this gray zone they're neither working nor do they allow themselves to rest right. they're kind of guilt-ridden in that in-between space mm. blaming themselves for being unable to work and unable to rest right well it sounds like you're doing some sort of since you mentioned the stoics I, i'd like to hear more about that but it sounds like you're doing some sort of philosophical counseling, but adapted to a specific uh, population. Yeah, yeah, it's funny because I I wasn't aware of you know philosophical counseling as a concept, nor was I aware of the concept of philosophical health, and I I read up on that, um. So I'm really intrigued. Yeah, I, I would say I am doing that. I I mean I'm a historian and a literature scholar by training. So my interest is also in bringing historical knowledge into the therapeutic process. Um, so I'm really interested in how our attitudes to work and time, for example, are shaped by the current zeitgeist and by you know, older religious and cultural forces. Um, we often operate on cultural scripts of which we are not aware. And, you know, especially burned out clients often have really toxic and damaging ideas about work, productivity, time, value, and so on in their minds. And they're not even aware that they are actually shaped by these conceptions. And some of them go back all the way to, you know, the age of, of Puritanism and, and Calvin's doctrines and so on. So, so I think one of the things I try to do in my coaching is also to um, bring in sociological and historical and philosophical ideas as curative elements, as um, healing ingredients, you know, because some of our suffering is not just individual suffering. Psychology is a big factor, but I would say that culture and cultural forces and cultural ideas um, often have a key role to play in our mental well-being. Right. Yeah, and, and I, th I think your training is, correct me if I'm wrong, your training is, is uh, German, uh, mine is, is French. So mm -hmm. I think we are culturally trained to uh, think outside of our disciplines, yeah. which is not, it's less, I mean, 
it, things have changed uh, and uh, we shouldn't do uh, easy distinctions, right? But so, of course, uh, philosophy should be also historical. History should also be uh, philosophical, etc. And, and this you bring as an interdisciplinary perspective, which might in itself be ref be refreshing for your practice, because sometimes, and again, I'm I'm speaking as a non-specialist. I'm just imagining what it might be to have a burnout. But um, I think a lot of it comes from this dominance of analytic thinking since the Industrial Revolution, which is very monotropic, right? M much uh, into uh, spaces of specialism that exclude uh, the, uh, the rest of the world and that become um, infinitely... Um, infinitesimally even um, controlling spaces. I remember someone, uh, one day I, I I directed a short movie. I was not really thinking about going into cinema, but someone told me, oh, if you, if you go into cinema, don't study cinema. Do like the Americans. They don't know anything about cinema and the direct movie. Because if you study cinema, you're going to start discovering this yeah. huge domain, you're going to become a, a specialist, and that might, uh, I mean, that might in some way make it more difficult to reconnect with the creative. I think it's important to know about the history of what we do, but then the challenge on how to remain creative is even more important. And I think that's echoes the sort of chiasm we have with academia. Uh, I avoided Canada for a long time because I wanted to write my novels and mm. my essays, and I had this intuition that it might uh, castrate me. Sorry for this um, a male metaphor, uh, but uh, is isn't it why also you're you're leaving academia now, or is it or is it because you just want to uh, focus completely on your practice? Yeah, I I think. I, I I know what you're talking about. I mean, there is a lot of, I think, you know, when you approach certain areas in a highly analytical, highly rational, and also really critical way, you know, because of course, we're also trying to be critical at all times in academia, right. you know, especially in the humanity subjects, you know, you're trained to be a critic, um, always finding the faults, the inconsistencies, you know, disagreeing with others. So, so it's a very particular mindset. And I think, you know, the kind of emphasis on left brain rational activities is definitely stifling to creativity. And it's also not valued in, in certain um, areas in academia where you have to adhere to very rigorous conceptions of what is, you know, what has cachet <laughs> in academia and what doesn't. And um, I mean, for me, the reason why I decided to leave was also because I've always been really interested in the history of psychology, the history of exhaustion and the history of self-improvement. But at some point I realized that, you know, the theory is one thing, but the practice and the lived experience of these fields is something else entirely. Um, and in fact, when I wrote my book on the art of self-improvement, I decided to train as a coach just to, mm -hmm. you know, get a sense of um, what works and what doesn't work and, and how some of those theories might actually um, impact real people. And then I just fell in love with coaching. I have to say, I, I've always flirted with becoming a, um, a therapist, but mm. uh, I find coaching actually much more appealing and rewarding as a concept mm. because there's more freedom in that framework. And you also work with um, different kinds of people. You know, you don't just work with people who are struggling with very serious um, issues, but also with people who, who just want to grow and improve and gain insights and who are not right. necessarily in a in a very dark place to to begin with so it's it's um extremely uh interesting and rewarding and energizing work but for me i think what i really wanted to explore was um the lived experience and the practice of of self improvement mm. um and and I, it's a form of learning that you know because you were talking about the monoculture of reason you know it's i think coaching is also 
a, a form of learning that is not just rational, it's experiential. And it is um, a form of learning where you actually have to get out of your head. And, you know, for me, that's something I struggle with as well. So we always kind of teach what we need to learn ourselves. So, so for me, that was definitely the area to go, you know, where you have to actually, I think for me, what makes coaching so exciting is this transition from insight, cognitive insight into something that you feel and right. that you live and breathe and that begins to color how you see yourself and how you how you experience the world mm. no i I'm, i really resonate with with what you say because so i i had a training in psychoanalysis which i never wanted to um put in practice because i think that a lot of therapy has become extremely normative so you're not listening to the person you're just applying a greed so it took me many years of reflection and actually it's a few just a few i i as i told you i i did my phd quite late when i thought i was strong enough to keep my creativity while being an academic and but very soon after i decided to to start a practice in philosophical counseling mm. 2018 and this is something that started actually in Germany and the U.S. in the 80s uh, uh, and with few isolated figures who, of course, are inspired by uh, the uh, philosophical practice of uh, ancient Greece and ancient Rome, right, which was indeed therapeutic uh, or, or thought to, to, to be so. And, um, and uh, I noticed... I mean, probably uh, you'll tell me if the, your experience was similar. I didn't think I was a person who, uh, for example, had the necessary qualities. For example, I didn't think I was necessarily the most, uh, the person with the most capacity for empathy. But I discovered a dimension which I call intellectual empathy, which mm -hmm. is different from emotional empathy. And I, I, I think that um well i discovered this is something actually that works and it you were mentioning and we'll get into the stoics but you're mentioning philosophical health where it came to my mind that yeah this is as much as uh physical health was sort of invented by an elite in the early 19th century and became so this sort of necessity for all uh for 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 good and bad uh, uh the same thing for psychological health uh, one century later right it starts with an, uh, a luxury for the happy few uh, in vienna or so and becomes necessity for all and i think 20th century we are in the moment where philosophical health which i think you're practicing in in a way uh is a, a luxury for some so our job is also to to see that it doesn't become a norm, uh, that it it remain it retains this sort of a, uh, openness of uh, possibilities. But I wanted to ask you. I mean, you can react on what I just said, but I also wanted to ask you then, what do you take from the Stoics? And then, and this might be related, is it self improvement or self transcendence? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, gosh, where to start now? Um, so I think, you know, what you described, this movement away from seeing everything through the lens of individual psychology towards focusing in on, you know, questions of, of ethics and how to live, you know, and, and eudaimonia and those ancient Greek concepts. I mean, there's been a real renaissance in in coaching circles, in self help circles, and now you know you you told me about um, this movement of philosophical health um, that has been active in the 1980s. I mean, I've noticed because I studied the literature of self help, I noticed there's a massive Stoic rena renaissance going on, like a real interest in Stoic thoughts. And I have my theory about why that is happening right now. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that at times when we feel particularly out of control, you know, when external circumstances become increasingly complex and, you know, globalization um, 
neoliberal global cat techno capitalism everything's becoming highly complex and we worry about our individual agency and our impact on these ever more complex systems so i think there is a reason why we feel very drawn to the idea of we can at least control what's inside us you know we have our own reactions judgments and emotions and rational processes to control this idea of control you know control in a world that seems to be out of control and where um control and agency is becoming ever scarcer is highly attractive and i do also think that a lot of people and that you know relates again to what you said louis a lot of people are tiring of the kind of focus on individual psychology it's you know the, the self is ultimately quite a poor side for meaning i think there's a real thirst for um connecting with higher principles you know with something spiritual with something that is communal in in our age of you know hyper individualist um monadic uh capitalism there, there is just this longing for for something else and and i think self-help is moving in that direction you know away from the you know enhance your personal effectiveness to the utmost degree uh, towards you know what does fulfillment purpose and so on actually mean um and it and, and a lot of people agree that it can't just be something utterly self-centered you know there needs to be some communal or altruistic or element of of transcendence to it for it to be you know to have some kind of pull um and you asked me about what 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 appeals to what what kind of ideas I use that are stoic ideas in in my coaching. So I do think you know the idea of the circle of control, what we can control and what we can't control. It's very simple. It's very well known. It's um and it's highly effective and incredibly hard to practice. Right? I mean, this idea that you focus on your attention and your energy and your awareness on what you can control and you try and detach as much as possible from what you can't control and um, that's one thing I try to practice with my clients especially those who are very exhausted and who are very limited in energy they need to know where to put their limited energy right where it can make a difference where it can actually have an effect and I also um love the stoic idea of um you know, just the sense that we, we, I, I love that the Stoics don't overestimate their individual agency, you know, their impact, the impact that they can have on the world. And at the same time, I do think they're a little bit too pessimistic about that. Um, and, you know, modern psychologists have added the sphere of influence to the stoic model right you have the kind of circle of control your, your you know your inner citadel your your inner reactions basically then you have what is outside of your control and nowadays people talk about the circle of influence and that of course is an interesting sphere right that's the gray zone because when when we control our inner life that will have an impact on on the people with whom we interact it will have an impact on the projects to which we are dedicated but what that impact is and how we can actually um, grapple with it um, and how far we can rely on it is is a totally different question um, so the yeah this idea of where do we where do we invest our energy I think that's a really important question and a lot of people scatter their energy all over the place without without realizing it so when we when we when we actually look at our energy in a more strategic way i think that can make a huge difference already mm. just so for the sake of dialogue i am going to challenge you a bit on not so much on the um, financial metaphors of investment but on the fact that and and it's more a challenge to the fashion of stoicism mm -hmm. um i've 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 had my my moment where i read a lot of stoicism uh, in my 18s 90s and it's true you're right that a lot of people discover today philosophy as a way of life through the stoics but very often i think the versions it's it's a 
a very um, one-sided view of what Stoicism is. Um, suspiciously apolitical. It has a lot of fatalism in it. And uh, very self-centered in a way. And there's a... a if, um, we tend to forget there the fact that the Stoics, they were... They had a, a religion, in fact, but a very pure religion of imminent nature, which is which is rather close to uh, Neoplatonism, in fact. So they were into self transcendence, and mm -hmm. see if we that that is, and I love your expression: the self is a poor site for meaning. That's a beautiful sentence. So it is really about the process uh, which was very important for the Greeks uh, before uh, Christianism, what they called apotheosis or theosis, right? Becoming like God, but in the sense like that we, we, um, we forget our, our self-limitation to sort of enter in, in communion with the imminence uh, of, uh, of nature and that aspect I think might be uh, forgotten today, uh, but you mentioned very uh, meaningfully that indeed people are realizing that this the self help the self development uh, hides an obsession for for the self that is um, that is rather uh, problematic uh in the sense that well we also have as you mentioned yourself people are scattered we also have um a series of people who are not necessarily uh feeling exhausted but they are feeling scattered in the sense that they have two many uh choices in the but they don't see that those choices are objects in front of them that are products of capitalism right so they're so it's like in in the supermarket of 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 destiny uh as opposed to feeling and i uh, i like the fact that you mentioned the uh the reconnection with the feeling this is something i work a lot in my approach to philosophical health which is creolectic so there is this central cosmology of you know process philosophy which may have many names i call it the creel creative real uh the uh, the asian greeks call it the one or more recently uh, as you know deleuze call it um difference bergson elan vital uh, there are many names right uh but i think it's important he did to uh to show people that the the highest faculty of thinking which is so much attacked today by a very um i think emotionally society is very connected to the wisdom of the body mm. mm -hmm. and in fact it's as if sometimes it's as if this reptilian emotions and and instincts and desires are in in the middle uh uh sort of uh impeding the the transmission between our very uh primal primeval being in the world and 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 the, the capacity of thinking really in the greek sense of theoria theoria right the communion with the divine um so there was a lot in there but but please Tell me how you you negotiate with this, you know, dualism that is sometimes present in stoicism. Yeah, um, I think I I I know exactly what you're what you're saying, Louis. Um, this idea that I think a lot of people use stoicism first of all um, as as a means to feeling calmer and more in control, and you could say that's a selfish aim, right? That's about enhancing um their well-being at some level but i would always say 
there's a second step, of course, you know, um, in, in coaching, we don't accept what are called dead men's goals. You know, for example, someone comes and says, oh, I want to feel less tired and exhausted. I want to feel more confident. I want to feel calmer. I want to become thinner. So people come with quite a few um, aims that, uh, that, that are about not wanting to do something, right? I want to stop overeating. I want to stop being feeling socially awkward. I want to stop feeling so tired. But the question is always to do what, right? What will you do when you're thin? What will you do when you're confident? What will you do when you have that stoic equanimity? You know, when you have that calmness of mind, when you're no longer rattled by external circumstances what will you do then there's always that second step and i think you, because you asked about transcendence and and a, you know connection with a bigger creative force and i do think that this is when the question of purpose and meaning becomes important you know because not wanting to do something is is not meaningful in itself right. um it's always a way towards enabling you to do something else and i do see um self-improvement ultimately as something that doesn't stop with just fixing yourself making yourself more productive making yourself more effective it's about being able to direct your energies outwards right the improved self in my definition doesn't um just enhance itself for the purpose of self-enhancement or to be more productive or better at x y and z the improved self is able not to waste energies on the inside but to direct these energies outwards to other people to creative projects or towards you know seeking some form of transcendence so i do think that that second step is is absolutely crucial mm. um and i agree with you that some some versions of stoicism kind of stop at the you know inner calmness level um but what do you do when you're calm right, right. <laughs> there's still something you have to do with your new state of calmness um and uh, equanimity as such is not life's purpose mm. um and i do think that we tend to you know, we tend to underestimate the what then, you know, it's like someone wants to be really rich, but then you have money, what do you do with it? You know, what, what, what then? What do you do when you're confident? And I do think a lot of people actually don't even go there. You know, they just see what they desperately want or what they desperately don't want. But then the bigger question is, is the one that touches on, on purpose and transcendence. Yeah, I think you're suggesting something that is important is that in our practices, we see people that are singular. So right now we're sort of generalizing for the purpose of the art of conversation, and uh, which is a pleasure in itself. But it's true that what we see in, in front of us with each person is always different and, and some nuances might apply. Having said that, uh, I would even add that they will never reach equanimity. They would never reach calmness. They will never reach this uh, sort of detachment as a step one if they don't do step two first, mm -hmm. right? And you're talking about purpose. Yes, becoming an ideal, embracing an idea, um, finding uh, a meaning that we think would get not only us but the rest of humanity closer to uh, paradise on earth uh, because i think that's what philosophy about it is about historically if you look already in plato etc it's philosophy came at a moment where religion was the dominant and said paradise doesn't have to be after we die mm. uh, paradise can be here so there's a I think philosophy is religion plus politics in a way. So let's talk about purpose then. Um, I think it's important, and you, you sort of alluded to it, 
many people have a misunderstanding about what purpose is, right? So they say, oh, I want to be a doctor. That's not a purpose. That's a strategy. There are many reasons why one would like to be a doctor, not all of them uh, being uh, beneficial for a sort of a harmonious view of, of what the world could be. Why? Uh, I mean, it's clear that people are searching for purpose and people do not have a very uh, clear view on how to get there. Since you are an historian, why do you think uh, this comes now at the beginning of the 21st century uh, uh, as opposed to 100, 200 years ago? Mm. Yeah, I think obviously, you know, the kind of externally prescribed models of meaning have fallen away hundreds of years ago, right? Like with secularization um, and, uh, you know, romanticism and the cherishing of originality and individualism and so on. I mean, purpose has become more of an individual um search and journey and then i think in the second half of the 20th century when, when perhaps you know the kind of age of psychology peaked um and, and purpose was very much related to um in our psychological values and then you also had you know you know in the 1980s and the 90s to a certain extent um kind of quite crude version of materialism out there. I think both of those um, external purposes haven't delivered happiness, right? They haven't delivered what people were expecting. They have made people feel probably even more despondent. Um, so I do think that, you know, the kind of narrative of material comfort, the narrative of, you know, self-fulfillment and self-realization, those kind of narratives have become a bit old and they haven't quite worked. And also partly because they are so detached from community. Um, and I do think that in the 21st century, we are also seeing the death of a lot of grand, so-called grand narratives, um, which makes people feel particularly uh, adrift and particularly, um, particularly, you know, just lost in a sea of options. And I think optionality is a, is an issue that people didn't have so much in, in previous um, eras. You know, like the this idea you can be everything you want to be. You can um, find the perfect job for yourself. You know, this idea that we have um, infinite choice and we just need to find the one thing that will make us happy um, and our choices have increased right I mean we can choose ever more um, options regarding our lifestyles our identities um, and so on so so that choice is also you know what Alain Ehrenberg the sociologist you know, talked about the weariness of self this idea that that kind of freedom becomes a terrible freedom at some point, that kind of freedom becomes oppressive because we can make mistakes, right? When we have so many options, we naturally want to make the right choices. We want to maximize our, you know, our capacity to create the optimal life for ourselves. And, and it's impossible and it's, and it's really, um, really hard to do. So I do think there's something about, you know, the loss of community, the, increase in options the pressure to get it right and then also our fetishization of work right i mean that's one of the topics that keeps coming up with my clients all the time that we expect salvation from work right this this narrative that work has to be meaningful we have to um, love what we do we have to feel incredibly passionate about our work so we expect from our work not just a salary status security um and so on but we expect i we expect work to furnish us with an identity and with meaning and with fulfillment you know so it so work has become massively overdetermined and it lets us down right i mean while while our expectations of what work should deliver have risen dramatically the reality of works become ever worse ever more horrific right. 
And so there's a massive gap between our ideals of work and, and the reality of work. Right. Work as vocation. Yeah. But I, I would simply add, and I think this is between the lines of what you just said, is that the problem is not that work uh, is the result of a vocation, because I, I think that's good. The problem is that what is out there in the market does not fulfill the conditions uh, for meaningful work, a lot of it. So I would like to share a scre the screen with you because I stumbled upon this Goethe's quotation uh, this morning, and I think it's quite fit for what we're saying. Um, you can read it, right? And I think this resonates well with uh, what you're saying, because in a way, I think people are looking for forms of life today. And this is a, I think it's a great opportunity for pluralism. And at the same time, it generates a lot of anxiety to which people respond differently. In a way, I think people who, who dive into a work that is not fulfilling are sort of trying to uh trying to hide the anxiety of of something more meaningful perhaps but um these forms of life at the same time they seem to be more and more even just the possible the possibility of of different forms of life seems to be threatened more and more by the kind of uh, hyperstructure that is being put in place slowly, right? Uh, the digital hyperstructure, very normative. Uh, now a way I, I would add, nice cat, um, <laughs> I would add also the idea of, um, you know, the, the fact that with globalization, we are less and less diverse, in fact, uh, under the the discourse of diversity. In fact, we see people who are very much the same with just different skin colors. But now I, I'm curious about, um, I see you, and I see you between hell and the heart as a lonely hunter. Mm. So... Um, makes me think of Hegel's idea that we must, you know, we, we must um, go through the negative in order to find the real synthesis. Is that, is that some sort of a message that it's conveying or, or, or am I over interpreting? <laughs> yeah, Louis, you're the first who has commented on both and the way they dialogue. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, interesting. I'm not consciously a message I was trying to send. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, that we have a lot to learn from, you know, hell in its various forms, <laughs> adversity and, you know, and the shadow side and the darkness. Absolutely. Right. I think without it, mm. the light is not as bright. Right. Yeah. And I think that's uh, a little bit the discourse of various um narratives that speak of self-transcendence because of course self-transcendence is not a giant jacuzzi right it's not a uh a, a spiritual spa it it, it is although I, I i wouldn't define myself as, as a catholic by practice probably somehow by culture but it is jesus in 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 the cross right that that sort of idea that hopefully we don't have to to suffer that much but we do we do have to uh experience the negative we have to embody it and in and that part of that today takes the form i would agree with you takes the form of um saying no to various, to this sort of uh, uh, lunar park 
of of possibilities, right? And we see, I think, we see a lot of people. Uh, I don't know about that, by the way, but we often talk about the burnout with people who have this uh, work, you know, uniform burnout. But I would assume that there's a burnout of people who want to try too many things. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think the um, oh, burnout can have so many different causes. And I think a lot, you know, on the one hand, you know, like if you define it strictly in occupational health terms, it, it's it's work related and it's create it's the result of a kind of chronically stressful, toxic working environment where people aren't appreciated, um, have too many tasks to complete in too short a time frame and um aren't you know aren't making aren't being felt valued and so on but but then i think a lot of people who are self-employed can suffer from burnout as well right you don't need to be in a toxic working environment you don't need to have evil bosses you don't even even need to be in a kind of you know horrifically competitive neoliberal market structure you can also burn out because of what's going on inside you you know we sometimes have internalized um we can be our own slave drivers right we can be our own um merciless bad bosses um regardless of where we are i think a lot of a lot of burnout is is generated by clearly definable external causes um absolutely but there's also um in a in our dimensions, you know, some scripts we may follow, some beliefs we have internalized about our value and how it relates to our productivity and our work and our output and so on. So I think burnout is a really complex phenomenon, but it's of course really interesting that everyone is talking about it right now, that it's so prevalent, that it's um really one of the defining epidemics of, of our age. Uh, but I do think that, you know, the topic of exhaustion is much older and it goes back all the way to ancient antiquity. And I would say at some level, people in all cultures have worried about exhaustion because exhaustion is about losing your life force, you know, feeling it ebb away, feeling it diminish as we age and, you know, fear of illness, fear of death, and also fear of loss of engagement, you know, the idea that we may slip into apathy, into nihilism, into not caring anymore. Right. Um, and, and every culture has explained exhaustion differently and pinned it onto different causes, you know, some external, some internal, some spiritual, some material, some psychological, um, some technological, you know, you have all these different narratives about what, what causes exhaustion. And um, our narrative is one amongst many, but I would say that obviously with new technologies, um, there, there is a factor there that, that um, has become exponentially uh, impactful on our, our mental health. Right. And, then, and I know you have, um, I know you have uh, to go soon. So I think we need to do another conversation, perhaps one of these days, to to continue this. But uh, perhaps we could conclude it by saying that it's about not betraying one's essence. That people who think that they can take shortcuts to success by betraying their essence might end up in a position where. Uh, if the essence can be compared to a fountain, uh, only a few drops uh, are left. Nevertheless, I think we would agree, and that also would take a longer conversation, but uh, I think we would agree, both of us, that the fountain is never completely dead, right? We can always uh, take out the stones that block uh, the the source and we are understood i understood that this is what you do and, and it's probably in a way what i also do and and i think the um the i think what is beautiful is that what you're doing is entering life is embracing life from the point of view of someone who has dedicated many years and continues in a way or another to to knowledge uh and and i think that uh, it's something that needs to be cherished because 
uh, knowledge is not very much respected as something vital today to the mm -hmm. point that we uh, we might be tempted to abandon it even to a so-called AI, right? Mm. So that's a, um, for another conversation also. But yes, is there another um, in the last uh, minutes or so comment or topic or message that you want to send to the world? Yeah, no, I just love that um, metaphor of the fountain, you know, and that might be blocked and we can we can move away the stones and, and we will always find that there's still some energy that will never cease and that can always bubble up again. So I really like that idea. And I think that's that's the work of of counseling and, and coaching, isn't it? To to remove Indeed. those blocks. Yeah. Indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will stop the recording now.